And hello, everyone. Joined by Pastor William Rose right now. I've been talking to him over the past few weeks. His story is amazing. And all of you, no matter what state you're watching from, you need to watch this because this could happen to any one of you. Honestly, Pastor, hello. Good to see you. How are you, Dave? Good to be with you. I'm good. So you never thought you'd be in this situation, probably. Nope. <laughs> so I'm going to run it down from the very beginning. Um, who, what, when, where, when did this happen? Was it last year or was it earlier this year? It was last October 22nd, uh, 2022. Okay. Uh, 20, October 26th, sorry. Okay, gotcha. So were you, what were you doing? You were just driving somewhere? Uh, my son attends Middle Tennessee State University and he had classes in the afternoon and I was driving him there. And uh, while in the process of waiting on him, I decided I would do also deliver for Uber Eats. I thought I would do some deliveries for Uber Eats while waiting for it for the next, you know, two to three hours. So he gets yeah. out of class. Yeah. And then what happens? You get pulled over? Well, I uh, was making a turn after delivering my last door. I was making a turn onto a uh, street. Uh, I stopped at the stop sign, looked at the stop signs, didn't see anybody coming, made a turn, but it made a wrong turn. Apparently, it was a two lane street. And so, know. as I tried to veer over into the right lane, uh, apparently this guy was speeding down through and was, you know, in my blind spot and I couldn't see him and we collided. And, uh, then once we got off the side of the road, uh, and exchanged insurance information, uh, we had to wait for the, you know, the police to come to a report for about two hours. Wow. Okay. So everything seemed normal then up until now. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, when did it, when did it get weird or when did it change? Well, after about an hour and a half, uh, my bumper was still my bumper. My bumper guard from my truck was sitting in the back, and I thought, well, I better get it out of the road in case you know don't want it to impede traffic. So I picked it all up. It was kind of a wet, damp day, and so I put it in the back of my truck. Uh, I didn't have any water because if I have water in my truck, I'm usually drinking it because I drink a lot of water. Um, so post COVID world, what do you do? You reach for the hand sanitizer and use hand sanitizer in your hands. The problem was I had my window rolled up and I had my heat running because it was a little cool. Okay. And I guess that kind of circulated the smell a little bit. And uh, so once the police arrived, they asked me for my license of identification. Okay. Thought everything was fine. Then they said, uh, have you been drinking? I said, no, I don't, you know, I haven't been drinking. I said, well, your car smells like alcohol. <laughs> I said, well, that's probably putting the hand sanitizer. I handed my hand the sanitizer. I said, here, it's, you know, Purell. Yeah. And they said, okay, well, your car is really, really strong with the smell of alcohol. And they left to go talk to the other guy. The other officer came up and asked me, uh, how many drinks have you had this evening, Mr. Rose? And I said, I haven't had any. And um, I was being totally honest. And she said, well, your car reeks of alcohol. And uh, they said, would you mind stepping out of the car and showing us the damage to your truck? And I said, no problem. But uh, at that point, I knew something was up. And so I got out of the truck. Because the truck has a step down, I kind of stumbled a little bit, I guess. Um, I walked all the way around, perfectly coherent, eyes weren't bloodshot, no slurred speech, and uh, showed them the damage to the vehicle, and they decided to administer the field sobriety test. What What is that? In t you're in Tennessee. What is that? I know in Michigan, where I am, in other states, they do like all of it. They'll do the breathalyzer thing. They'll do the walking in a line. Yeah. What, what do they do there where you were at? Basically, uh, they did the they call it the NSG test where they, you know, track your NSG uh, for any sudden jerk to eye movement. They did the walk in the line where you got to put one foot in front of the other and stay on the line. They don't stagger. Uh, and then they did the holding your leg in the air on one foot, you know, counting, you know, 1001, 1002 till they tell you to stop. Yeah. Um, and that didn't go well because obviously I have I have balance issues. And uh, have eye issues I've had since birth. I have the video here, and that's, I mean, that's you. And I always watch these things, and I'm like, I don't drink much at all, but I would even have trouble. Like I told you before, I have a friend. You're, you're stumbling right there. I have a friend that couldn't do this. He's, he's clumsy. I'm clumsy. Mm -hmm. I think in most cases, what, oh, and then they're arresting you right there. Um, I think in most cases, then they would bring, okay, well, let's do the breathalyzer thing. They didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I asked him for a breathalyzer over the field sobriety because I knew that I had issues with balancing with my eyes. And they said, we don't do breathalyzers in, in Rutherford County in Murfreesboro. 
they said, we do blood alcohol tests and we'll do that after the field sobriety test based on your beat, what we observe. Okay, so they, they actually put you in handcuffs and take you somewhere? They put me in the handcuffs and said, you're being arrested for DUI. And then what, you go to the jail? I went downstairs, uh, I went downtown to the, uh, to the jail uh, where they again searched me. They searched me before, but then they searched me again. Um, took, you know, obviously my belt, my jacket, my phone, all that information, my license, and uh, put me in a cell with about 12 other guys, um, yeah, like a holding cell, yeah. till I actually came out and was, you know, they questioned me. Then I appeared on video with the video magistrate basically telling me I was going to be bonded for a $1,000. And then they said, but due to the fact you have no record, we'll do what we call a pre-trial release, which will release you on your own recognizance. But after you're booked, mugshotted, fingerprinted, all of that, which took place several hours later. And this was in downtown Murfreesboro, Tennessee, actually. Did they, did they do the, like, literally draw blood at some point? Yeah, they drew blood. They drew blood. And then, of course, obviously sent it off for testing at that point with the DBI. When, when when do they like? Do they draw the? I I haven't been arrested. I hope yeah. Hopefully it doesn't happen. But when do they draw the blood? Right when you get there. Uh, they draw the blood once they actually have searched you, okay. um, and and basically make sure you don't have any weapons on you or anything like that. Okay. Um, and then you know, you know they they actually I would say probably took place about thirty minutes after I was you know taken out of the handcuffs and searched and all of that before I was put in the cell. Yeah, that's you literally in a picture of being arrested there. So you get out. Um, you were there for, what did you say, eight hours? I was there for eight hours. It was seven hours before they even did the mugshot and booked me and all of that. So this entire time I'm having to wait for them to book me, process me. And then based on the pre-child release, they erased the bond and said that I could be released. But that I was going to have to put an interlock device on my car, you know, that you would blow into. Yeah. Um, my car, my truck actually took almost three months to repair from the damage. So there was no way I could put the interlock on it. At that point, they said, well, no problem. We'll just put an ankle bracelet on you and fit you for that. And that way we can monitor your alcohol and your surroundings where you, you go. Really, not. How are you, were you upset as could be? Because you knew you, you, you hadn't had anything to drink. You weren't drunk. Were you just mm -hmm. furious? Were you furious? You're a man of God, obviously. But yeah. How, I was scared, Dave. <laughs> this had never happened. I've never been in handcuffs. I've never had a record. I've never been arrested. Uh, I'm a family man. I'm a godly man. Yeah. Been in missions most of my life. I've been a pastor, youth pastor, children's pastor. I've done it all. And so in that moment, I was scared because I knew I was innocent. And I'm like, this is going downhill south fast. And I don't and it, but I cooperated. I was scared, but I cooperated because I knew better than to not cooperate. True. So how long? So you get out. How long did it until you got the results that it was a zero point zero blood alcohol? You had no alcohol in your system. How yeah. long did it take? How long did it take to get that? It took uh, possibly two months to get the alcohol test back. Two months. Two months. Yeah. And then after that, they sent it back to test for drugs, barbiturates any other kind of things in the system. And that took an additional six to eight weeks. Oh my God. So let me bring up, the, let me bring up the headline from the article here. It says minister, that's you with a zero BAC arrested by police for DUI. So they, it came back. Did you like, do you get a letter that says, how do you find out that it's 0, 0.0? Do they call your lawyer? You get a letter. I, how's that, how's that they work? give me a copy of the, t they sent a copy that says here, ethanol, alcohol, whatever amount in system negative and then on the other one that i got from the drugs it said 0, 0.0 on both counts and what was your reaction when you opened that and read that you're like i told you so yeah basically wow. and I told so, them, wow. the biggest thing dave was my family was completely confused you know we couldn't believe it um uh, my kids were extremely upset because they've known me all their life they've never seen me drink alcohol or do anything criminal or do anything, you know, that would bring shame on the family or on my relationship with God or my ministry. Yeah. I, okay. So that happens. And I would think that, well, this is where we run into problems. So you're not told you're cleared. You're, you don't have, you're not going to jail. You're not paying any fines. 
right? All that's done with. You're not dealing with any of that. That's all right. I mean, that's clear. Yeah, that was that was dismissed eight months after uh, my arrest. Eight months. It took that long to get it all dismissed. Yeah, the TBI drug it out for a very long time. And you're in a, in a totally innocent man. So yeah. I, I'm going to guess that it's created a lot of problems with background checks. I don't know about jobs. How has this impacted yeah. you? Um, well, it affected my background checks for jobs. I mean, I, I was able to finally get another job, but I was immediately deactivated within that eight hour period from Uber Eats because it showed up on my background check that I've been arrested for in charge with DUI. So obviously being an Uber Eats driver, that doesn't go well, go over well. Um, and then it took me about another four months or so to find a job. I worked at that for about three months, but after three months I was laid off. Uh, according to them, I was laid off, but I had to go every month to appear in court. Uh, so I'm assuming that had a lot to do with it. And then I finally got another job that's close to my house. I've been working there for about six months and it's been going well. So, wow. but as far as, as far as the insurance goes, I was dropped from my insurance back in January. Uh, my family was, and they told me I would have to find insurance elsewhere. And uh, when I asked them why, they said, well, you know, based on your driving record. Well, you know, I've had accidents in the past. They knew about that when they took, brought me on, yeah. but I've never had a DUI on my record. And I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. Uh, I was also in e e English as a second language teacher during this time. and I lost all of my classes, all of my income. Uh, I went to three different places that I was teaching. I had probably a total of about 30 students or 40 students in those classes. Uh, which brought in significant income that was gone immediately um, because I had no v vehicle to travel. I, I had no way to get there. Uh, the original thing they told me was I couldn't drive until this was over with, but then they said, no, you can't drive without the interlock device on your vehicle that you blow into. And I said, how am I going to put that on a destroyed vehicle? It's trying to be repaired. And they were like, well, that's when they said they would go ahead and put me, you know, fit me for an ankle bracelet. And I told my lawyer, we need to fight this furiously. There's no way I'm putting an ankle bracelet on. I, you know, I, I, I haven't done anything wrong. No. So we finally got that approved with the DA that I didn't have to do that. And um, so I want, to mention, I want to mention real quick for the people who are watching right now, um, there's going to be a link to a GoFundMe page because you're probably out thousands of dollars and you, you've been hit hard. Your family has been impacted. Yeah, we're trying we're trying to raise right now just to recoup just in that three month period, not counting the other months. You know, we, we lost about thirty thousand dollars between legal fees and trying to find another vehicle. Wow. And then um, obviously the impound fee, I had to pay four hundred dollars to get my truck out of impound. Um, I asked them if I could tow it somewhere else. They're like, no, no, no. We tow it to the impound. You have to get out of the impound. Um, obviously the transportation to get my kids back and forth to school and work, I uh, get my wife to work. Um, and then of course, you know, the legal fees, like I said, and the court fees and all of that. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, we lost quite a bit of income that we really didn't have. It's by the grace of God that we're still standing through all of this. Yeah. Um, I'm, so <laughs> the, the state of, uh, you were pulled over, you were arrested for drunk driving, Months later, the state of Tennessee sent you a letter saying, oops, it was a mistake. Your blood alcohol has 0.0. .0. You weren't drunk. Um, so, but it has basically destroyed your life. So it's kind of that you were guilty before you were even proven. And it's, you're guilty immediately yeah. in the eyes of the law, it sounded like. Yeah. And to clarify, we were actually, I was not pulled over. We actually had oh. been sitting on the side of the road waiting on the police report. So they never observed me even driving impaired, I uh, which is even more <laughs> shocking yeah. that they would consider me driving under the influence when really there was no proof other than the field sobriety test didn't go well, obviously. I, I see uh, this, this article the station did here and they say the this is not this is not um, unusual, I guess. And what surprises me, they didn't do the the breathalyzer thing. I, I thought it was standard protocol across the country. I guess it's not. Yeah, apparently they can decide in that county whether they want to do one or the other or both. But I know here in Davidson County, they always have both. You know, only they do both in Davidson County here in Nashville. Yeah, but so they did not do a breathalyzer. You get to the jail, they do the blood. 
and two months later, you found out, they found out you had a 0.0, you weren't drunk at all, but by this time, your life is just... Yeah, damaged. appended. Yeah. Wow. So it's been, um, it's been a long 17 months, and we're still dealing with, even though the charges have been dismissed, the charges have been dropped, it says dropped, you know, we can't prosecute based on no evidence. Um, so even after all of that, even the Murfreesboro Police Department never sent an apology letter or anything saying, hey, we, we messed up. Um, so how does it work with like, if someone goes and searches your name in the court records, do you, does it still show up? In the court record, I don't know. Uh, supposedly that portion of it is cleared. I just know that it's still on the background checks. And from all the consultation and research that I've done, uh, they only cleared the legal side, like the court judicial side. So as for the background checks, they don't clear that. That's something I have to deal with for the rest of my life, probably. Every time something comes up, I've got to be able to show them proof that, yes, the charges were dropped. I was innocent. But I got to go to each individual background check agency. So once I find an agency and I know that they deny me and they say that's the reason why, I have to literally go to them and get it sponged from their record. But then the next agency that it comes up in, I got to do the exact same thing. That's ridiculous. Um, yeah. yeah, because the way everything's so automated, as soon as the charges go in, it probably goes across the world, all these websites, and it, mm -hmm. and it probably shows up. Um, okay, so what is, being a man of God, I mean, this is testing your faith probably. And, and <laughs> I mean, how, uh, oh boy. Um, What's the message now? Basically, your name is cleared. I mean, you didn't do anything wrong, but right. now you you just want to. What's the yeah. goal now? Just to let everyone know that, I guess, right? The goal is at this point, I'm I'm still trying to get my life back. Uh, I'm I'm unable to drive right now because I don't have a vehicle and I can't get insurance. Um, and so you know, right now until this is cleared, I'm you know I'm walking to work and walking back from work because I you know, work two blocks away. Um, but if I need to go somewhere, I've got to wait till my wife gets off or uh, my kid gets home from school or from work and have them basically drive me to the grocery store to pick up groceries or whatever, or take an Uber, which is expensive. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm still looking for a legal attorney out there who will help me handle the civil part of it, but due to qualified immunity and the police can't be basically prosecuted for anything, no matter what they do wrong. Um, nobody wants to take on the case because they feel like it's a losing case. Yeah, and you probably had a lot of money already spent on a lawyer, probably. Yeah, yeah, I, I spent quite a bit of money on lawyer, and uh, he did a great job. I mean, he was a good lawyer, um, but wow. unfortunately, but unfortunately, he only handles criminal. He doesn't handle civil. What I was going to say, yeah. what message to other people? I guess it's good to get this out there because I did not know this this happens. And apparently yeah. it, it, it does. The basic happen. message is this. The basic message is this. You need to demand a breathalyzer and don't let them tell you we don't do breathalyzers. Because had they done a breathalyzer, Dave, they would have known there was no alcohol in my system. And this whole thing could have been avoided. In the state of uh, Tennessee, the state of Tennessee sent you that letter you just showed me saying that yeah. your blood alcohol was 0.0. .0. So basically yeah. your, your name, your life has been crazy since last October. Yeah. And also they were not wearing any body cams. They didn't get body cams to this year. And everywhere else that I've ever seen, if I've had a wreck or I've seen somebody pulled over or on a news report, the police always have body cams on. Had they had body cams on, they would have heard me telling them, I need a breathalyzer. I have balance issues. I have eye issues. Um, I mean, that would have helped me tremendously if they had had a body cam and given me a breathalyzer. That would have eliminated at least 90% of this problem. Yeah, because I, I watch a lot of the live, you know, patrol shows or whatever, cops. And it seems like they always ask someone before they do the walking thing, you know, do you have this? Do you have eye issues? Do you have I, whatever it might be? They didn't, they didn't even ask you any of that stuff. Well, they asked if I had any medical issues. And I said, look, I have eye issues. I've had eye issues since I was born. I also told them I have balance issues due to, you know, due to being slightly overweight. And then I was later diagnosed, not at that moment. I was later diagnosed with basic ataxia, which is a balance and equilibrium issue. Oh. Um, but I mean, even today, Dave, I, I try to do the test in my house. I can't keep my balance. I can't I walk a straight line. I don't know if I could. My wife doesn't even dance with me because she said I'm not a good dancer. So, um, 
Wow. I was perfectly in my five senses. I mean, I had no bloodshot eyes. There was no alcohol in my breath. Um, I was fully coherent. And other than the field sobriety test, you'll see on the video, if you look at the entire video, I'm walking around the vehicle several times, completely in my right mind, yeah. carrying on a full conversation with them. Uh, I didn't try to flee the scene. Um, you know, I didn't try to do anything that would be abnormal. Um, you know, I cooperated 100% what they asked me to do. Um, you know, I had been in communication with my family the entire day. I mean, we communicate by text, chat all day long. So we find out how's everybody doing? What's going on? Is there anything going on? You know, you know, yeah, they, they let me know shocked. how. <laughs> yeah, they were completely shocked because we've been communication. In fact, I called when I had the wreck. I called my son and said, at MTSU, I said, I might be a little late. I got to wait on the police to come. My truck's destroyed. I think it's still drivable. I'll come and pick you up. I mean, that was my full intention. My other son was at work in Cool Springs in Franklin, which is a 40 minute drive. My wife had to go pick him up from work, take him down, pick up my other son from Murfreesboro. They had to go to the police station to try to find me. At that point, I hadn't been processed. So they didn't even know that I was there. They tried to say, what is he here for? Well, we don't know. They said he's being arrested for drunk driving, but he's never, he, he doesn't drink. Wow. And they said, well, you know, here's a number. We'll call you in a little bit. He probably just hasn't been processed yet. Then one of the things that was a condition of my release was that I would be released to a sober driver. Dave, they released me after eight hours into the back door, walked me out and said, you got 45 minutes to get off our property or we will get you for trespassing. Hopefully your ride shows up. No sober driver, no paperwork signed, nothing. Wow. Have you lost faith in law enforcement or is this just one? Yeah, unfortunately, I have, Dave. Yeah. Uh, I know there are some good people out there, but I, I no longer trust law enforcement because it's been a, a nightmare. Yeah, that's, that I just can't get over. My, yeah, because it's affected your whole life. Um, well, I'm going to I'm going to put the link out there as, as well. And I'm going to put the link, um, put this everywhere, because I think this is something that everyone needs to know. Um, and I always thought about that, the breathalyzer that, and it's shocking. And maybe this will help or force that department to train, change the way they do things and other departments, well, other departments. You know, look one, at this. one more thing I would recommend you asked what else I think that I should have done, but I didn't think about it because I was scared. Always record with your cell phone, always record the confrontation because then you've got proof of what's been said, what you said, especially if they're not wearing body cams. And uh, yeah. I mean, I didn't think about it. I, I, they, I didn't even think about when I got there, how do I call a lawyer? I've never had a lawyer. So the first person I called obviously was my wife. And I said, I, I'm being processed. I, you know, this is going on. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. And, you know, please try to help me find a lawyer, you know, call somebody, you know, cause I don't know what to do. Um, yeah, and it with was, your phone. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, put your phone on record, put it in your pocket, and even if it just picks yeah. up the audio of what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, if I had been recording it, which obviously you have a right to, um, if I'd been recording it, then I would have had some kind of a notification of what I was saying versus what they were saying. And also, um, I didn't know that I was going to have to have it in that moment. So that's why I didn't, you know, I have it yeah. sitting on the side. It's cut, you know, it's cut on, but I didn't think about, hey, push record, you know. You, you wouldn't think you wouldn't think you, you wouldn't think you'd have to. Um, right. OK, well, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to write this up, put it out there. And if everyone can share this video and hopefully it'll do yeah. some good. And um, my prayers go out to you and your family. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing is they the entire time they were very bullied about it. You know, they're just kind of bullying me the whole time, which it, it really, you know, Another reason why if I had recorded it, I would have had proof that they were just being bullied about it. Um, but, yeah, it's certainly a nightmare that no one has to go through or should not have to go through, especially when you're innocent. Uh, yeah. But definitely record the conversation, demand a breathalyzer and have a lawyer on standby just in case you never know you're going to need it. Have someone you can call immediately to to start the process of fighting for you. Um I mean, it, it's a lot of stuff <laughs> and a lot, lots of good lessons. And yeah, keep me updated. Let me know if there's anything else I can do. Let me know.